It's amazing you shared that little bit of revelation you just shared. I'm sitting over there and, and you said, I just got to share this one thing. And what went through my heart, what I was hearing before he said that, and don't get familiar with this, catch this. We're always talking about the forgiveness of sins and God forgives us, but John said something amazing. He said, behold, the Lamb of God who what? I, don't, I think sometimes we miss what happened when we just say he forgave me. He took it away. Come on. This is ridiculously amazing. Like, he took it away. That means no more regret. It's illegal. Guilt, condemnation is illegal. Shame is illegal. He took it away. He took it away through his blood. That's like, like he remembers our lawless deeds no more. So why are we ashamed? Once your heart sees and you care and you go, duh, you can't do anymore. You can't go back and retract. You can't go back and erase words and actions. You can't go back and do one thing different about what you did, where you've been, what you said. You can't change it, but you can change. And once you change, then you're no longer the person we're talking about. That's how you die. So you can live. So you put off the... And you put on the new. And you understand that he did something on the inside of you. That made you care. Like you never cared before. Make you change your mind. Like you didn't have a change of mind before. To make you see it different. To want different. To wish you never. But you can't wish you never enough and not get in regret without the gospel. The gospel takes it away. It's imperative we get this. This one thing I'm talking about is what hinders intimacy with God, with people. Because they don't see themselves the way He sees them. And then they don't pursue Him and approach Him because they don't see themselves the way He does. And then they're perplexed why He would care and why He would pursue them and why He would travel with you in the corridors of darkness and sin and depravity and always be there. And even if you make your bed in hell, He's there. Like we don't even understand. We're like, so, so we got to understand that He's pursuing you to get you out of darkness and bring you into the light. Watch. When He gets you out of darkness, you're out of darkness. <laughs> <laughs> just don't stop with he forgave me he took it away he'll remember your lawless deeds no more you got to let him take it away you got to say yay thank you that I'm not who I used to be I so appreciate the change you've brought to me thank you where I didn't care I care now where I didn't see oh I see now you've brought change to me you got to See, because if not, you won't put on what he paid for. You won't wear the clothes that fit. You know why people's lives that are sincere don't look like him? Because they're not wearing what he made for them. They're wearing things that don't fit. They're wearing things too tight. They're wearing things that clash. wonder if you woke up every day and actually believed he took it away. wonder if every day you just wake up and you know and believe you're right with him. You didn't even do anything yet. You just woke up. But you woke up right with him. Why? Because there's blood that's been shed and applied to the mercy seat speaking better things than what you did. <laughs> this thing... It's so simple, but so profound. Like, if you don't get what we're talking about right now, 
you won't experience this whole joy, joy, joy thing. It's the joy of your salvation. It's not the joy of your circumstances. It's not the joy of everybody finally giving you your due and treating you right, giving you respect. That never happens. It's the joy of your salvation. It's good tidings of great, my translation, ridiculous joy. People say, man, calm down. No, you're so wrong. Like, you're wrong. Calm down. Yeah, but you don't got to, you don't even know what you're saying. Why do you even, it says people mock and scuff what they don't understand. If you don't understand, you probably shouldn't say anything. <laughs> oh, he took it away. Just camp in there for a little. It's why we pray for the sick. Why do we pray for the sick? Because he took it away. He took sin away. He took the fall of man away. He took every thing we did that was in darkness. He took it away. He judged us in righteousness. He rules his kingdom with a scepter of righteousness. You come and you bow before him and he meets you in righteousness. Boom. He slips a robe on you. Boom. And you stand up before him right before the presence of the king. No sense of guilt, condemnation, or shame. Boldness to enter in to the throne room of grace and receive mercy and help in a time of need. Scripture found that. I read that in Hebrews. It's there. Fires me up. Come boldly. Not apprehensively. Not arrogantly. Just understanding he paid the price and he took it away. Why I was yet a sinner? He came. I didn't change. I didn't do anything right. He just came. In my life, there was things I knew that were right, and I still didn't do them. There's things I knew that were wrong, and I made sure I did them. There was times I violated my conscience. I tried to dull my conscience. I tried to escape my conscience. But it was just right there. God never changed his mind. He never said, what a knucklehead. I gave him enough chance, enough time. If he didn't change by now, he'll never change. He just never did that. On the night he came to me at work, I didn't do one thing, one thing to draw his audience. I didn't do one thing to get his attention on my end. He just never took his eyes off of me. He loves me. He saw that I was living outside of what I was created to be. And he knew me the whole time and knew that I didn't know who I was. He saw every insecurity. He saw every twist and perversion. He saw every wrong motive. And he said, forgive him. He doesn't know what he's doing. And that plea is before the throne. And God the Father woos and draws and comes. The night he saved me. I didn't do anything. I didn't say, God, I need change. I was working. I was in denial. I was a hypocrite. My life was a zero. I was ready to make probably the biggest mistake of my life. I wasn't with my wife anymore. We weren't divorced, but we weren't together. And I was about to make the biggest mistake of my life. I think you follow me. I was probably days away from making the biggest mistake of my life. God came. Out of nowhere. <laughs> and when I look at my life, and it came out of nowhere to what looked like nothing. <laughs> 27 years later in June, it'll be 27, 26 and a half years later, I'm still a little excited about this. It's fun waking up clean. It's fun actually believing the truth and the truth making you free. It's actually fun believing that the grace of God has the ability to change us. It's actually amazing to understand what selfishness is and see it for what it is and put it off and put on love. It's like incredible to wake up and have nobody owe you anything. 
Nobody is positioned to hurt you or break you heart because your identity is found in Him and you owe no man anything but to love. Sounds like freedom. Sounds like something I never knew before. Sounds like something I never even asked for. He just came and brought it with him. <laughs> so he loves me that way, forgives me that way, and all of a sudden it's the only eyes I have to see with now. Why? Because I believe I'm forgiven. I believe he forgave me of everything I've ever done. I actually believe he took it away. I'm not going to be a Matthew 18 evil and wicked servant and hold you accountable and put you in the prison of my heart because of something. You don't owe me 500 denarii. He took it away. Oh! So I go to bed clean. I wake up clean. I'm clean before a shower. I'm clean after a shower. I'm just clean. You say you're out of your mind. No, I'm out of yours. I'm, I'm done. We live in things that don't bring life. I'm done with me, myself, and I, and how I feel and what I think. Well, they shouldn't. Well, how come they? Well, they never will. I don't know why. I'm done with it. I'm not, I'm not going to give myself to that and call him Lord. <laughs> I'm falling apart. <laughs> it's your fault. No, no, yeah. <laughs> See, he is no help at all. He's like, you're welcome. <laughs> it's the truth that makes us free. I think we're afraid to preach it. I think we think we got to keep talking about sin and our billy sin, and we sin every day, and it's good God forgives us. We're just sin, sin, sin. The Bible says, reckon yourself dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. Why are we in false humility and lack of understanding talking about our ability to fail when we can keep our eyes on His grace that keeps us and empowers us and makes us everything He paid for? Why would we hold on to an identity that's less than what the blood of Jesus declares over us? It's not humility. It's false. I got so much scripture to prove that. How, how do you reckon yourself dead indeed unto sin and boast in your ability to commit it and think it's humble to say we probably all sinned by mid-morning? You're not even supposed to be thinking that way. You're supposed to be reckoned dead to sin, alive unto God. You're not waking up on eggshells, kept the minutes till you fall. You're waking up right with God because of Him, because of the blood of Jesus. Because he said, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing, but we know them from the beginning. Watch. We know why they're here. We know what they're created for. We know their calling. We know their destiny. We know what they'll look like if we're in them and they're surrendered. We ain't giving up on them and we ain't changing our mind. And even if they never believe us or receive us, love never fails and we'll stay the same. It's the gospel. And you've got to believe it. Not just talk about it. Believe it for yourself. You've got to look in the mirror and learn to see what he sees. And not see regret. And not see what your uncle did. And not see what your dad didn't say. And not see how your mama... You've got to look in the mirror and see the gospel. Oh, <sighs> Yeah, I'm about ready to. <laughs> you got to look in the mirror and see what he sees. Because the greatest commandment is love God with everything you are. But the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as you are. No wonder we have so much trouble with our own identity. 
So you never can fulfill the greatest commandment. Some of your neighbors don't want you to love them like you love yourself. They're saying, wait till you get a grip. <laughs> see, how you see yourself is how you'll see others. And if you're nitpicky and fault-finding and living in regret and backlash and memories and past and stuff, then all you see in people is what needs to be tweaked and what's wrong and what you don't agree with. And all of a sudden, you're tricked into regarding men according to the flesh because you see yourself according to your life, not his in you. It's so important to look in the mirror and see what he sees. Man, I'm serious. I'd, I'd talk to that person in the mirror. If you're a guy, I'd say, dude, you got it going on. I can see the blood of Jesus was shed for you. And you're receiving it and you're believing it. I see the light of his countenance in your face and I see his love in your eyes. In fact, I can see, sir, your life is the will of God. He predestined you before time to be found in him and there's a time to be born. And am I not looking at you? You're here, man. And it's because God said so. You got to learn to talk to yourself. <laughs> and if you're a girl, you got to say, hey, girl. <laughs> Girl, you got it going on. And I ain't talking about Cosmopolitan and Esquire. Is that a magazine? <laughs> you say, Girl, you got it going on because I see him in your face. I see how he loves you. Or he'd have never died for you. If he didn't want you, he wouldn't have drew you. Girl, you ain't got no reason to be insecure. You ain't got no reason to be low esteemed, self conscious. I see how he loves you. Oh, I'm telling you, girl, you ought to get a mirror. You ought to believe something about what he said. So people's words don't carry so much weight about your appearance or your weight or your hair texture or color or the shape of your ears or the size of them or your nose or your lips. So none of that menial, temporary, burn up in a wisp and vapor of time stuff don't carry weight. And you don't get tricked into and sucked into the mind and pressure of the world. But you look in that mirror and you stop dreading what you were born like, dreading what you look like, wishing you were somebody else. Because of pressure, because of the world. You look right in that mirror, hey girl. Were you not knit and formed in your mama's womb by his very hand? He did a good job because I see him in you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, ladies, I wish you'd find a mirror <laughs> and believe him. Not that magazine, not that, not that commercial, not that airbrush plastic lady. <laughs> I'm messing up, ain't I? <laughs> Guys, did I tell you this? He took it away. He's the Lamb of God, and He took it away. The sin of the world. First Peter, you know what First Peter says? He died on a cross. He took your sin and my sin. And he bore it on a tree. Why? So that we, having died to sin. You say, well, that's impossible, brother. Ain't nobody perfect. Get your mind off even the action of sin for a minute. Let's go with Jesus on this thing. What about the identity of sin, the memory of sin, the stain of sin, the sting of sin? What about wrecking yourself dead to everything that thing is trying to mark you with? And get off 
thing that's trying to wear you so you can put on the truth. So we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness and by His stripes we were healed. Ooh! This thing isn't rocket science. It's just love and powerful and whoa! But it's simple. And if it's so deep that you got to scratch your head for three days and study, it ain't the gospel. Here's the gospel. We were lost. We were making all kinds of mistakes and our hearts were far from him. And he said, I ain't never lost sight of you, never changed my mind about you. And I paid a price to redeem you and get you back. Now, if you'll come through my son, you come back to me and come home. And I'll robe you and I'll ring you and I'll celebrate and we'll throw a feast. And I'll put who I am inside of you and you can shine. Oh, yes, you can shine. Yeah? Is this stuff important? It's important if Jesus said, you're the light of the world, let your light so shine before men. If the Christian purpose is shining, then anything that keeps the light off is deception. If he said, let your light so shine, anything that tones you down, just mediocre, just tone, just planes you out, deception. Anything that grabs your disposition, strips Christ out of it, deception. You're alive to shine. And the enemy is just pressing on the church. He don't care how long we worship tonight. He he don't care if we'd still be going. He cares if you shine. He cares if you leave here and walk in love and make peace and show mercy. He cares if your spouse just absolutely acts up and goes off the deep end. You ain't moved by it because you're moved by grace and love and compassion and prayer. And you're alone in a room weeping for your spouse, not weeping because of your spouse. You're weeping for your spouse, and heaven is right there, hearing, and Holy Spirit is moving. We say, why doesn't God move when this stuff? We are praying and praying. Because most of the time we're praying because we're hurt, not because we're hurting. My wife prayed for me for 13 years to change. I didn't change. I got worse. When she gave up on me, I celebrated and said, I've been waiting for this day. Why didn't I move on sooner? I've been wasting my time with you. I was brutally, brutally, brutally deceived and just messed up. My words were nasty. I put her down. I said things people should never say to a human. People say, I can't even picture you like that. I'm born again. I said things so vulgar and evil, just hurtful to her. She said the day she gave up on me, she went to her bedroom and she said, and I'm done with you too. She looked up at her ceiling, I'm done with you too. I don't know why she didn't look in. Hey, we always look up way out there. Old man on a cloud with white hair and maybe a beard. (laughs) We were always looking up. She said, and I'm done with you too. And she pumped her fist. You know what she said in an analytical mindset, a rational mindset, a human reasoning mindset? I prayed to you for 13 years. 13 years I prayed to you. And you've done nothing. In fact, I think he's worse. You've allowed me and these children to suffer through hell. And you've done nothing. I don't need you either. She walked out of the bedroom. Whoa. Lived for six months in darkness and blindness, doing things she knew she'd never do. Because it wasn't her. It was pain and hurt and unresolved conflict. It was anger and frustration. It was driving her. It was having baby after baby, giving birth in her life. <clears throat> One day he came in the bathroom seven weeks after I was saved. She was dolling up and doing her hair and getting pretty to go somewhere. He walked in the bathroom. Poof. She goes, curling brush in her hand. Because <gasps> he's standing there. And she knows it. He made sure she knew it. <laughs> and 
Ain't it awesome? He ain't mad at her. Ain't it amazing? He didn't just write her off when she ranted and vented and pumped her fist. Ain't it awesome that he ain't stuck in unforgiveness, getting counseled by the 24 elders? Ain't it just awesome? Ain't, ain't it amazing that he doesn't even flinch? She said, what? After all I did? Jesus, you dying on that cross? That girl is so inconsiderate, so ungrateful, selfish, foolish girl. I don't think we need to have anything. I'm trying to matter her too, Lord. I hung and did all that thing. She don't appreciate it. She's worried about her own small self. Ain't it awesome they never even think that way? I wonder why we always think that way. If he didn't teach us that, where'd we get it? He ain't never taught us this stuff. Why is it our main language? We must have been homeschooled in the wrong home. We must have had wrong teachers standing in the class. Ain't that something? The things you and I have majored in, we ain't never caught him in it for a moment. He never modeled it. He never taught it. He never demonstrated it. And we've mastered it. And yet, he never told us and showed us and taught us to be that way. So it ain't him. Where'd we get it? Why do we stick to it so tight? Why do we only find people that agree with our pain and buy into our story? What are we trying to support ourselves? Come on. When I use an illustration and have Jesus talking like that, it sounds ridiculous. Because we know Jesus, the person of Jesus. Well, why isn't it ridiculous when it's us when we're made for his image? When we're called to shine, when any man that says he abides in him ought to walk even as he walked, he's the firstborn among many, brethren. The things I do, you'll do if you're a believer. Why is it just so easy to snap back? Why is it just so easy to give a piece of your mind? Boy, I wish it wasn't easy. I wish we'd make it so hard. Because we've been with him. We've looked at him and we have honored him. And we aren't just singing to him. We are following him. <laughs> and he's a good teacher. And he said, don't you call anyone your teacher. Because you got one. And he's the Christ. So if I didn't learn it from him, I've never learned it at all. My wife's in the bathroom. Spirit of God. Poof, Right in the bathroom, standing there. She thinks she heard it with her ears. She's not sure. Kim, why are you so mad or angry at that man? Can't you see? She said when he said the word see, it was like somebody ripped something off her face. Just years of unresolved conflict, words, unforgiveness, pain, repeating the story after story to friends. Just going to a home group as the hurting wife. And the home group just putting her on a chair, calling it faith and compassion, sympathizing, crying, wondering why she has to be stuck with such a wretch like me, praying for God to comfort her instead of teaching her I'm not her identity. <laughs> he said why are you so angry at that man can't you see he's not the man you're angry with God said that to her <laughs> you see why I'm pumped he can't lie he can't lie can he does God lie is he a man that he should lie you both know that right so watch this story this is good this is my favorite part coming up he said, can't you see? That's not even the man you're angry with. In fact, Kim, that isn't the man you married. I have made him a brand new man. And what's she doing? 
All she's looking at is the old. All she's doing, you know what she's saying? I prayed for him for 13 years and then when I give up, he goes and gets saved. He makes me so mad. It's too late now. <laughs> Self-centered, delusion. It works on a soap opera, but that's Hollywood. That's the world. That's cheating and fornication. And Man, I hope you don't watch that stuff. I don't usually sound legalistic like this, but I hope you don't watch that stuff. And get desensitized to what he died on the cross for. Mm. That's garbage. Garbage. It's heart and offense. Normal. They ain't getting what you need. Get it somewhere, baby. That's garbage. Why wouldn't they did it? They'd be showing me more attention. Stop it! Needs driven, emotional driven, never the answer, never producing the kingdom, never producing life, just heaping up hefty bags on your shoulders. 50 gallon hefty bags of garbage. I'm, am I okay? I'm so sorry. I, don't, I, I felt like I'm sounding mean. It's not my heart. Listen, listen, don't get deceived. Why? Why? Ah! In the church. Why is sleeping with somebody outside your marriage when your marriage ain't working? Why is that so easy for people? It proves we're doing church, but we don't know him. You say, well, I just was alone. No, he was in the room. He was in you. But I was just so hurt. Yeah, and how'd this help? Well, you think the man that did this loved you? You're vulnerable. You're just, he's just working with you because you're available. You think it's love? It's an emotional high? He says all the right things? Are you kidding me? You ought to sit in a man's locker room. You ought to sit in a bar and hear how men talk when you ain't around. You think because they want to sleep with you, they love you, they care? No, they got itches and they're scratching. Most of the time, that's the raw truth. Honestly, for most men that aren't in Christ, you don't even have to look good. You just need to be willing. How's that for just straight? And you're flattered because they lust you? You don't want lusted. You don't want the slit in a place that catches a man's eye and he looks at you and now you feel like a woman. That's Hollywood. That's soap opera. That's garbage. You don't want a man grilling you. You don't want him lusting you. Oh, am I okay? Because I feel, I feel nervous. I'm so ramped up right now. My wife is in the bathroom. Can't you see that's not even the man you married? I've made him a brand new man. So guess what I am? I ain't even got to try. Brand new girl. I ain't even got to try. I'm just strolling through the earth brand new. I'm just waking up brand new. I'm just spending my day brand new. And I believe it. I ain't a man they remember. I ain't a man that did that and that and that and that. I'm the man that believed on him and received him when he came to me and drew me. I'm the man got a love by him and forgiven by him and he took it away. I'm the man that he put a new thing on. And I'm living that new thing. And he came to my wife and said, what are you looking at? Can't you see? That's a new thing. She fell on the bathroom floor and cried out of control in a fetal position. And guess what he did? He hovered over her and made peace about her rant. And you know what he said? He said, it's true you prayed for 13 years. And I realize you say I did nothing. But you don't realize how you kept me from moving because of the motive of your prayer. 
Never one time did you pray because you loved him. You only prayed because you were hurt by him. You were reduced to another hurting wife that prays. And you never once prayed because you had mercy and compassion and knew that he was lost. You knew if I changed him, your day would go better. He said, that's never me. That's not my love. And I can't answer that prayer and empower you to stay there. What a revelation she got in the bathroom. Laying on the floor, crying in a fetal position. I'm out in the yard working a crop of beans. And she comes busting out the door, running at me. I'm looking for knives, blades, machete. <laughs> kidding. Kidding. <laughs> she wouldn't talk to me. She wouldn't approach me. We didn't have conversations. I didn't pursue her. I didn't preach at her. I didn't run up to her in insecurity. You got to change. You got to give me a chance. I'm new. I'm a new guy. You got to love me. You got to forgive me. I didn't say one thing about nothing. I let Jesus take care of it. He's a lot more convincing. (laughs) Woo! He comes strolling in my bathroom like it's his. Like he owns the place. Just comes strolling in my bathroom with my wife. And say, hey girl. (laughs) Why are you so mad at that man? Can't you see? (laughs) That's my God. He ain't mad at her. He ain't like, oh, you selfish thing. You want to go to church? Take your kids to church. Your kids are going to grow up in church. And then you want to pump your fist at me and make this all my fault? You self-centered little. Can't say it because I'm good. I'm messing up. People say, keep it real. This is real. He hovered over my wife and said, you've been tricked into becoming another hurting wife that prays. The only reason you're praying because of your pain, not your love. You ever see those scenarios? You ever been in that? You pray and pray and pray and you wonder why nothing's changing. It's getting worse and God ain't even moving. And you don't even seem like he's near because you ain't praying from his heart. You're praying from your need. And if God answers it, he empowers you to stay where you need. And he actually teaches you. If you spoiled your children, people would say shame on you. And then you want him to treat you the way that people would say shame on you. My wife came running to me. She's coming. The door slammed. I heard it. I looked up and she's on a dead run right at me. I'm standing there with a rake or a shovel. And I'm like, she's crying so hard. I thought somebody died. I thought she got a phone call and somebody died and it broke her down. I thought she was crossing the line of her stance because of tragedy. It's the first thing that hit my mind. But I hear her talking repetitively under her breath and she's saying something over and over and over and I can't understand it until she got close. You know what she was saying? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Poof! I went, it was an ugly, ugly movie scene. We're just, and I got to tell you, I was bothered that she's saying she's sorry. Because this is my moment to be sorry. Because I'm finally sorry. Because I live like a jerk. I I was unloving. I never loved my wife one day. I needed her. I used her. It was bad. I didn't cheat on her. But man, I cheated her. Never loved her, never satisfied, controlling, sharp-tongued, beat-down words. And she's saying she's sorry, and I actually see what I was. I'm ready to sincerely look her in the eyes and say, I'm sorry. Guess what happened? The gospel came in and got her eyes off of me. And got her eyes back on her and her life and her destiny and her calling. And all of a sudden, it wasn't even about what I was. It was about what she had become. And all she can say is, I'm sorry, because now all she's thinking about is her own life. 
And she's not thinking about me. And she don't have no permission now to be outside of Christ because she just stood with him in the bathroom. And he just set her perspective straight and went, eh. And as soon as he did, sorrow filled her heart and responsibility filled her heart. And she ran to me and was saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was perplexed. I was like, Kim, I can't even imagine how you could be sorry. I've been wanting to tell you how sorry I am. I just haven't wanted to approach you. I didn't want to talk to you before the time. She said, well, I just met God. God was in the bathroom. And she told me, I'm like, what? It was messy. I said, what do you keep saying you're sorry for? Guess what she said? She looked me right in the eye station. She said, for not loving you in prayer. She said, the only reason I prayed for you because I was hurt by you. And I knew if God changed you, it would make my day go better and easier. God showed me I was reduced to another hurting wife that prayed. And he can't answer that prayer and leave me there because it's not his love. Forgive me for not loving you. Oh, it was crazy. I mean, I had fluids coming out everywhere. Everywhere. I think my ears were crying harder than my... It was everywhere. <laughs> we talked and shared and hugged. First time in five months plus seven weeks. I talked to her about being ready to be a husband to her. She said, is there hope for this marriage? I said, hope. I'm finally... Ready to love you. And she went, oh, we're crying. And I said, can I renew my wedding vow to you? I'm a spontaneous man. I didn't know this was coming. I didn't have baggy eyes and crumpled papers by the nightstand trying to be eloquent with my speech. This was coming out of my heart in the spur of a moment. I said, can I renew my wedding vow to you? She said, oh. I said, I want to renew my wedding vow to you right now. I didn't even know what I was going to say. It's like when I get up to preach. Can you tell? I have no idea, and, but it comes. So I'm ready. I'm seven weeks old in the Lord. Spontaneously, I said, can I renew my wedding vow? She said, okay. Here's what came out of my heart. Because it, remember that who was here when I shared the thing about women, creative value, and coming out of the fullness of God and men. Did I share that yesterday evening or this morning? Ooh, that was this morning. Oh, so a lot of you didn't catch that. We actually had a little morning service. Sorry. <laughs> it was just for some leaders and some core folks and stuff, but... It's pretty awesome. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, this is what came out of my heart. I looked it right in the eyes. Watch what I said. Some Christian psychologists, not making fun of people, don't even have the understanding. What they would, they would want to crucify me for saying this and try to tell me how marriage is a lot of work and 50-50 and we all have needs. And here's what I said to her. You owe me nothing in this marriage but to receive the love of God from me. And as long as I draw breath on this earth, I will serve you in his unfailing love. And she said, okay. <laughs> and I said, now I need a pen and a paper and you write your vows down in all caps and I will hold you to them. She just fell in my arms and cried and gave me the honor of being a husband to her. Two and a half years later when I was pastoring, she slipped into a lie and believed people only acknowledged her because she was with me and my wife and they loved me. That's a good way to shipwreck your identity. And all of a sudden she's changing on me and I call her aside in the private and I find out what's going on. She doesn't want to tell me. I say, honey, you're my wife. I know something's going on. Well, just talk to me, honey. I love you. What's, well, I just realized. She was so, it was so, became a belief. I just realized that I'm just your wife. I'm like, what? She said, people only say hi to me, acknowledge me, and treat me well because I'm with you. And they feel like they should. It's not because of me. It's because of you. I'm like, What? Honey, you take me totally out of the equation. You're still a woman of God. You're a daughter. You're anointed. You have a calling. You have a purpose. You have a destiny. You're not riding on my coattails. What are you talking about? No, it's true. It's not true. 
She let that lie fester and it led to stuff and weird and all of a sudden I have no access hardly to my wife emotionally. I'm living married but like I'm single. She's in her own little cave and it feels like I can't reach her and I talk to her and she's not there and it was crazy. It was just believing. It was she wasn't possessed, wrong believing. Eight years later. Yeah, yeah, now watch. Not, not, not making a, a, an example out of you, but watch. Eight years sounds like a lot. But it's nothing in the light of truth. Why does eight years change truth? I'm not saying you would let it do that. But that's reactionary. You hear eight years, you think eight years. Eight years. A year is a thousand. A thousand is a, a day is a thousand. A thousand is a day. Time has no ability to change truth unless you think so. But do you get it? Let me ask you this. How after eight years is my vow any less valid? Why am I off the hook of my vow because of the eight years? Where does she qualify me to back out of my commitment to love? If love doesn't seek its own, and love takes no account of the wrong done to it, and love never fails, then why has anything changed from me to her? When she doesn't earn it, how can where she's at keep me from seeing her value, potential day? The more she lives outside of it, the more I want to love her because I see how lost she is. I'm not frustrated with her. I'm not saying she needs to do her part. I'm not saying, brother, you got to pray for me. I got so much pressure on my plate. The last thing I need is my wife living in this place. She don't come out of this place and do something soon. I'm just going to break, man. You got to pray. I need a breakthrough. I got a breakthrough. The stone rolled away and the spirit of God came inside of me. Oh, I got a breakthrough. Eight years, 80 years. It doesn't change love. Because I'm not a self-centered man. I didn't wake up for her to love me. I didn't wake up to need her. I woke up to be like him. (laughs) And I'm going to let deception change that. I'm going to let eight years change that. I'm full-time pastor. You know what? She stopped coming to church. She wouldn't even come to church. And I'm full-time pastor. That sounds so pressure and... But everybody saw my life. Everybody saw Jesus coming out of me. Everybody sees God moving through me. Everybody sees I'm totally fine. So nobody really like what's wrong, what's going on. Nobody was concerned. Elders and leaders didn't sit me down and say, I think we need to, like you put your position on hold. You can't even manage your home. No, they understand that she was deceived and I had the honor to love her and manifest Christ. And everything I was preaching, I was getting to model and live. And they said, you stay right where you're at. You stay active. You're in faith for your family. And you haven't been moved by what she's going through. You've been moved by him. We are honored to have you pastoring here. And they just let me keep flowing. Yeah. <clears throat> she wouldn't even come to church. People would call. You could hear them. Kim, just touching base. Haven't seen you for so long. She'd be right there listening. They're only calling me because I'm so messed up. They think I'm so messed up. They don't really care. They just know I'm so messed up. I said, I wonder if they care. They don't care. What do you mean? Honey. No, she just wanted to die. She cried. I just want to die. She said, it'd be easier for you. It'd be easier for you if I die. You're married to a nutcase. I can't get it right. I said, oh, you can get it right. I said, you can just believe God right now. Start with me now. And just let me love you again. And just believe God. Come here. No, 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 no. I said, oh. So we'd have all these little things. She's just wanting to die, but she's afraid to do it. She don't want to hurt the kids, but she thinks it would bless me. I said, what do you mean? Well, it would turn you loose. You could do us for free. You wouldn't have to care for me. I said, I'm not carrying a burden. You're not a weight in my life. I love you. Yay. I've pastored. I know people don't handle eight days of what I'm talking about. And they got grounds for something. Oh, come on. I'm getting real. I've pastored for a while now, 
People go through eight days of what I'm talking about, and they're already making decisions. What do I do? And seeking counsel on ways of escape. Man, if God had that mentality, we're all lost. None of us have hope. If God had the ability to quit on us, he'd have quit it on many. She wanted to die. She wanted to die. You know what happened? This strange voice started coming to me every time I walked into my prayer closet. Every time I went in to pray. Only when I went in to pray. Never said anything until I went in to pray. Tried to imitate God and sound like God. I never addressed it. I just listened. But it was only when I went into my prayer closet to pray. Hey, your wife's really struggling. It's really getting bad. I'm just going to take her. I'm going to take her and you'll be fine. I promise you'll be fine. You'll have peace. You'll be able to run well and never look back. You'll be able to this and this and this. It's just going to be better this way. You have to trust me. I'm just going to take her. Every time I went to pray for two months, I'd hear that. I'm just letting you know, I'm going to take her and I'll make sure you're okay. I'm just giving you a heads up. Do you know how many people write books how God told me my spouse was going to get cancer and die and why I'm okay because he gave me a heads up and they took the sword right out of their hand. Took faith right out of their life. You're supposed to pray for the dead to raise. God doesn't position you to let people die. I promise you, it's a lying, familiar spirit. You can hardly talk about this because people have their testimony wrapped in this and have written books about this. But I experienced it firsthand. And all of a sudden, my wife is in a violent seizure two months later. And my wife is in a seizure for one hour. Any nurse, mind, any nurse trained people here? They gave two different shots that bring you out of seizures. They gave both ones because nothing works. So they gave both. Hour long. Long time. She ended up intubated on life support with severe brain damage in a coma. I'm standing by her bed and this voice says, this is what I've been preparing you for. You'll be okay. Trust me. It's better this way. And all of a sudden, you realize this voice, it's just, it's all about you now. Better for you now. Sounds like Egypt. Sounds like Israelites. Be better for us. 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 In my heart, not my voice, in my heart, I said, Lord, I've been listening to this voice for two months and never addressed it, never talked to you, never responded. I'm hearing it now by the side of my wife's bed as she's in a coma. If I've ever needed to hear you, I need to hear you now. Because this voice doesn't, it sounds like when you talk to me, but it doesn't sound like the things you say in your word. And guess what happened? Down deep in the center of my being, my best friend in the whole world whispered to me. And he said, mercy. <laughs> you see what's wrong with me? I got a lion spirit trying to get trick me to let her go because it'll be easier that way, better for me. The Lord said, mercy. I turned into a madman. I laughed. I cried. What is it? I craft. I craft. I looked at the nurses. I said, hey, girls, I got to run. I want to talk to my children. I'll be back. Thanks for loving on my girl. And they're like, what? Is he, he's leaving? He's what? I said, it was over. When I heard mercy, it's over. We win. I drove. I was pumping gas. If you just saw me pumping gas, I said, damn, what's up? How's it going? I wouldn't have said, oh, my gosh. Keep me in prayer, man. My wife. Blah, 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 blah. I'd have said, awesome, doing good. How are you? How's the fam? Everybody's good. Bless you, man. Thanks for saying hi. Why? This isn't my story. This isn't my world. My story is him. Christ in me. Mercy. I'm not calling every prayer chain on the earth. I'm not trying to get the whole world to pray so God moves. One moves a mountain. One in faith moves. Faith. One is a majority. 
So I ran back in the hospital with my boy. He's 14. We prayed for mom. 20 seconds. 20 seconds max. We walk in. She's swelled. Doesn't look like her. Her eyes are bulging. She, she's not home. You can't find her pupils. You know how I'm looking right at you? I just looked right at you. Why? Because you're alive. I'm alive. I can, the eyes, the window of the soul. I'm looking at you. I couldn't see my wife. I, popped, I crawled right up on the bed and I popped her eyes wide open. I said, hey, girl. I did. I'm not joking. I said, hey, girl. I said, your boys are here. We come to get you out of the snap. You've been sleeping too long. But I couldn't see her. And I could tell I couldn't see her, so I didn't pray long. I just didn't want to. It's your wife and visuals. And I just said, Father, I think she ready to pray, boy. He said, yeah. My boy was shook up because he was 14. He had his own struggles he was going through. We talked about some things before. He, he didn't even want to go. And I said, I'm not going to make you, and I won't be disappointed, and I'm still proud of you, son, and I won't be mad at you if you don't go. I think it would be a great experience for you to go and see the glory of God touch your mama. He's like, I got on the phone. The doctor called me and said, hey, I need your permission to do this and this. I don't even know what he's talking about. I'm not a medical guy. I don't even, I, I'm, I don't, well, forgive me. I don't even talk about this stuff. I just live a certain way, man. He's telling me, I said, listen, doctor, all due respect. I don't, now's not the time for me to get a medical education. I don't even know what you're talking about. Just do what you think's best. I'm not a liability guy. I don't have an attorney in the wings. My eyes not raised, not brows not raised. You're doing your best to help my girl. Just do your best. I'm not holding you accountable. Just thanks for trying. And I said, I'm gonna I said, listen, this is what you were trained for. This is what you took loans for. This is what you paid for to get trained and equipped for moments like this. Just do what you do, man. And I said, I'm coming in to do what I'm trained to do. And he said, watch. He said, What is that? I said, sir, I'm going to lay hands on my wife and the kingdom of God is going to come upon her. Now watch, now watch. He said, well, okay, sir, but I have to face the reality of this thing because I'm a doctor. And I need to do this spinal tap and blah, blah, blah. And we're very concerned that your wife could die. I said, sir, I am so sorry. Watch what I said. It's not arrogant. Please bear with me and don't hear what I'm not saying. I said this stuck. My boy was standing right there. I said, I'm sorry to put you in this position when I said what I said because you couldn't possibly hear or understand because you've seen dozens, maybe hundreds of confessing Christians pray, quote scripture, cry, be despairing, shook and caught off guard, standing over their loved ones and everything you said would happen, happened. And they came in and tried to build a house in the middle of a storm. And I said, you are not talking to one of them. I'll see you soon. Click. That's not arrogant. <laughs> so I feel the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Put our hands on her. I looked at my boy. Here's what you're waiting for. Here's what I'm waiting for if I'm not careful. But I've been in this thing a lot. But I used to get caught in this a lot. Don't get caught in this. You're waiting for her eyes to open. You're waiting for her to snap back. You lay hands on her, and, 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 and all of a sudden, she's nothing. She just still sucking on that too. <sighs> you prayed 20 seconds of sincerity, the best thing you understand, and she's going, <sighs> <sighs> and that's where we mess up. Because now we pray again. Because we believe what we see, not what we said we believed. Now we try again. Now we try again. Now we're in unbelief and don't even realize it. Now we try again. Now we're trying to color flag and we're quoting an Old Testament thing that stirred me up in a bedroom once when I felt God. When do you just believe him? When is 20 seconds of believing God enough? I said, Father, I thank you for my wife. The destiny of her life shall be fulfilled. You get up, girl. You bam. I prayed whatever I prayed for 20 seconds. It doesn't even matter. It's what I believe. And I looked at my boy. I said, you ready to go? Because your mama's going to be well. He said, okay. I took him on out the room. We're going out through ICU. He starts crying. It's bad. He's crying bad. We're at mechanical doors. We're in ICU. Shh, you can't be doing it. Son, pull it together. We're in ICU. We got to get out. Shh. Shh, come on, shh, boom, shh, boom, shh. we're going, man. I get him out in the hall, he loses it. I said, buddy, come on, pull it together. I told your mom will be fine. He pushes me. My boy ain't like this. He pushes me. It ain't about mom. 
It's about you and me, Dad. You and me. I'm thinking, now we got some kind of family unresolved fallout, something. What's going on? I said, what do you mean, you and me? What? He said, there's a difference between you and me, Dad. There's a big difference. I said, there ain't no difference. We're both called to be sons of God. We're both washed in the blood. He's sitting at the right hand on both of our behalfs, buddy. You have the same access as I do. Same Holy Spirit. Ain't no difference. He said, no, Dad. He said, you don't see what I see. You don't see what I see. He's freaking out. And he cried pitifully and fell on my chest and said, and I don't see what you see. You see how you can pass this thing on? You see how you can provoke people into something because you're walking it? Because he heard me talking to the doctor. He saw testimonies his whole life. He's sitting there getting his hair cut, and he sees the lady that can hardly focus because of her headache get totally delivered, and then I take her to where she's six in the biggest bondage of her life, and you ain't never let that go, girl, but God showed me in the hair place. Fire! Ah! <laughs> he's nine. He's sitting in the chair. She's rocked. The guy who owns the place said, that was incredible. I said, yeah. I said, that stuff comes on me almost every time I come in here. I just wasn't sure. I didn't want to say, you mean you could have done something like that before? I said, yeah. He said, every time. Do it every time. <laughs> I said, okay. Okay. I'll get my hair cut a lot. So we got this heritage. He's saying, you don't see what I see, and I don't see what you see. I just said, I see Jesus. I see Jesus, son. I said, I don't see a mom in a coma. I see Jesus. He's high, and he's lifted up. I started quoting some things, and I'm hugging him. We headed out. Hour and a half later, my wife opens her eyes. Medical training? Watch this. Is this possible? She has an hour seizure. They run a new EEG because of her coherence or awareness or attentiveness. They're puzzled. They're perplexed. They run a new EEG. Not one trace of a seizure. No seizure activity on the new EEG. Hour-long seizure. From my understanding, you can have a seizure you're not even aware of. And it shows up on the EEG. Not a trace of a seizure on her new EEG. <laughs> She's a medical girl. She just went. <laughs> well, guess what the doctor did when I walked in the hospital? I walked in the hospital. He was in a meeting, white coat, clipboards. He drops clipboard, goes like he runs to me. He said, Dan, my gosh, your wife is doing amazing. I said, I know. I said, that's why I'm here. The Lord just told me to get on in here and see her and be with her. I said, doctor, I want to thank you for everything you've done for my Thank me for what we, we didn't know what to do. We were at the most painful place for a medical person. We were at the wit's end. We didn't know what to do. We're in that terrible waiting game. That's what he told me. He said, we didn't do anything. I said, you did a lot. You cared, you tried, and you loved me, girl. Thank you. He went, doctor, grab me and help me because he was so overwhelmed because none of it made sense. I said, his name is Jesus, doctor. He's my king. He would love to be yours. I go into my wife's room. She's sitting up in her bed. She just came out of a coma. I walked in. I looked at her, and she said, hi. Raspy voice, Drake. Hi. I said, hey, you. I said, hey, girl. <laughs> I said, hey, you. I said, my goodness, I started to cry. I said, you have never been more beautiful. She said, really? I said, I'm not talking about appearance, looks, cosmopolitan. You're alive. This thing tried to kill you. And you're alive. You're so beautiful. She said, what happened? She had no memory, no knowledge. I told her. I told her how bad it looked, what the doctor said, the phone call I got, how Daniel, I come in, she went, right in the middle of the story, she went, watch. She went. Remember what she's believing? Be better if she just die, free me up. Guess what she did right in the middle of my story? You held on to me. You 
hold on to me. You didn't let me go. You didn't let me go. I said, you ain't going anywhere. <laughs> I love you. How's that for fun? Shore beach despair. God, please. Pray, 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 pray. And then when she dies, can't imagine why she died. Well, see, God doesn't heal everybody. It can't be the will of God to heal. We were all praying. There's a thousand people praying. Somebody had to have a mustard seed. <laughs> oh, I've been around us. Not being mean. Just relating, being real. Family meeting. Living room. Just keeping it real. You know, when your heart's not clear, sometimes death's a gift. It's easier when people die. Then you don't have to deal with nothing. If I was a hurting husband, it might have been a gift. If I was carrying pressure, it might have been a gift. Might have even said it was the Lord. Might have said that two-month voice was the Lord. The two-month voice obviously wasn't the Lord, people. Or she'd have died. I wouldn't have heard mercy. God wouldn't have confounded a doctor and made him cry. Wonder if you don't stay close to him and every thought you have you think is the Lord. Wonder if those things look for opportune times and come when they think you're vulnerable and say stuff they think you'll believe because of how you feel. I'll bet you. It's good to be free. Selfless is a goal we should all be like, yay. Keep making me selfless. God, teach me what it looks like. It's not perfection, it's purity. We're not like risking failing. We're privileged to become. Don't ever hesitate to step out in this journey. It's not about you missing it. It's about you arriving. And if you don't move forward, you never get there. It's not about missing it. It's about becoming. It's not about perfection. It's about pure in heart shall see God. It's about when you do stumble. You know you've got an advocate. Or if you do, not when, I'm sorry. Scripture says if you, that's big. If you stumble. You have an advocate, Jesus, the righteous. In other words, don't lose heart. Don't give up. Don't jump ship. Don't sink. Just run to him and get washed, grow wiser and sharper. And let the weak say, I am strong. Are you with me? So you see how powerful it was when that wedding vow came out of my spirit? Who knew that two and a half years later she'd go AWOL in a deception and eight years Eight years, she'd be in hiding, in deception. And I lived married, single. No real access to my wife. No real fellowship, co-union. For eight years. Totally free, loving people, seeing healings. Having the time of my life. Why? Because Christ is in me. I don't become a product of my circumstances. I don't say, well, you don't know what I'm going through. I see what he went through. And that's where I find me. And then I live from that place. The way we give up on each other, the way we get so crushed by each other, it shows me that we don't see him like we could. The way we move on from each other. I'm not trying to condemn you. If you've made those choices, just get what I'm saying now and just don't make them ever again. And you cross the finish line. Look, not, don't you get condemned if you made those choices. It's not about condemnation. It's about becoming and growing up into Him in all things. You say, well, I didn't know any of this. I'm on my third marriage. So make sure you live this now. Make sure you live out this conviction. Make sure you don't repeat performance. Make sure you step in and reveal by the life you live that you've been changed. 
and refuse to regret and refuse to give up. This message is not condemning anyone. It's throwing you right in the race. But if somebody don't talk about this, it might be your fourth marriage justified. Fifth marriage with a story. I'm not being mean. I'm being real. I wonder if we could take that language away. All of a sudden we can't do what we did before because we don't see like we used to see. And all of a sudden, instead of being hurt, we're hurting. Instead of being angry, we're merciful. Instead of being irritated, we have compassion. That's how dramatic the difference is of seeing and not seeing. And when you're not seeing and all those things are your reality, you tend to find people that agree with your pain. And they become your support system through sympathy, which assures you'll never be free. Because they'll keep you where you are and you'll believe you belong there. That's good stuff right there. Like that's worth admission right there. And this was free. <clears throat> Phew. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. Hey, that clock freaked me out. I looked up and it said 109. <laughs> now it says 910. Why did it say 109? The date. Phew. It said one dot dot 09. I'm like, 109? I know this was good, but it wasn't that long. <laughs> Oh, is it the 8th today? So that thing's prophesying that we're going to be here till the 9th. <laughs> no. Is this a ministry group? Is this a recovery group or something I'm looking at? Yeah? It just felt that way. Good. Proud of you guys. Don't ever look back and don't ever give up. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Yeah, keep growing in him and put on that new fresh identity in Christ. And don't get frustrated. Keep your, don't feel like, well, I ain't getting it. This ain't working. That's a sign. That's, that's, that's spiritual adversity. Don't let yourself get frustrated. That's never cool. It's never, it's never okay. It's the first thing that happens. How easy it is in our life to just get irritated. That's a sign of demonic activity trying to get you out of focus, out of purpose, out of... I'm telling you, fight against it. Keep each other out of that thing. Encourage each other. Cheer each other on. Iron sharpen iron, okay? I just feel this in my heart. I'm not talking to any specific man. I'm talking to the whole group. Frustration and feeling irritated and short-fused, I'm promising you, is a sign, a real early sign of just deception. And just know you're not created for that and you're not called to that. The blood of Jesus was shed for you guys because you're worth it. Whoever paid a whole lot for something that wasn't worth what they paid. They nobody bought a car. He, anybody a car dealer? Don't be ashamed. <laughs> anybody a car salesman? Because they get a bad rap like they're, like they're bad people. But it's actually the consumer trying to rake them down, get their commission, take them rock bottom, get the best buy. You know us guys, we go buy a car, we think we got the best deal in town. We're strutting home. We're like, I knocked that guy down. He ain't going to eat for two months. I'm just saying, look, 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 see that what we do? So, so the price tag's 13.9, 13.9. So what do we do? Well, oh, man, I'll give, watch, watch, watch. I'll give you, I'll give you 12.2 and you absorb the taxes and the transfer fees. And because in your mind, you already got figured 11.9 because you're figuring already, you've been told they make 2000 commission automatic. So you're trying to get that back. Ain't that what we do? So whoever walked into the car lot, and the car says 13.9, and you said, dude, that's a nice car. Oh, that's a real nice car. You Kelly Blue Book and it right in the lot. Wow. Blue Book says, says 14. And you got it 13.9. Kelly Blue Book says 14. You're right in the ballpark, dude. But you picked it up at auction. You got that thing low, man. You're, you're making commission. That's what you, and you're telling him, right? 
But whoever walked in and said, 13.9, Kelly Blue Book says 14. That's a nice car. That's a real nice car, man. See, Kelly Blue Book, 14, 13.9. It's really fair. Just pay it, man. Straight up. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you 15. <laughs> Who's ever done it? <laughs> nobody. Every, any car dealer that would not be ashamed to be a car dealer would say, nobody did that. <laughs> Why? Here's the point I'm making. When you finally write the check, what do you believe in? That what you're purchasing is definitely well worth the price or you wouldn't have paid it. And all our life, all we hear is he died because we're sinners. He died because we're sinners. He died because we're sinners. And we think that's so right. He had to die because we sinned. He didn't die because we're sinners. He died to redeem the lost. He died to save us. He died to restore us. Nobody pays a high price for something they don't believe is worth it. The possess, the purchase possession has to be worth it to the buyer. And my whole life, nobody talked to me about that. And when I preach it, there's a whole bunch of people out there listening, listening. Heretic, blasphemy, died for our value. We're like worms in the dirt. He died because we're sinners. We should be glad we're saved and he even considers us. And they have no ability to even hear what I'm saying. But it don't matter because he died for my value. He died to restore me. He died because I was a lost son. He didn't die because I was a sinner. He had to die. My sin cost him death. But the purpose of his death was the redemption of my life, not just the forgiveness. And ain't no preacher on the earth ever told me that Jesus died to restore my purpose, destiny, and value. Guys, he died to restore what you're created for. Not just to forgive what you did. Amen. To turn you into the men he created you to be. So you can pick up now on level ground and have a present and things to come. And live that thing till the day you're with Jesus. And take a legacy to the throne. <laughs> yeah? Woo! And the only reason I focused on the men, because that word's for everybody. Because when you come from a background like they came from, there's so many lies involved, flashbacks, memories, and voices. And there's a whirlwind of emotions. And if they ain't producing life, that's a good barometer. They ain't from the Lord. Y'all good? So what do you say? What do you say since it's 109? What do you say we pray for the sick? Can we pray for the sick? Thank you. Yeah, we're, uh, yeah, nah, we're okay. We are okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm not bringing nobody up here anyway. I ain't praying for you. <laughs> Let's pray for the sick. You know why we're going to pray for the sick? Some people get puzzled when I say this, but it's why we pray for the sick. It's why I pray for the sick, the forgiveness of sins. He forgave our sins, all our sins. How many sins did he forgive? All. And heals all our diseases. Why? Because he forgave our sins. Isn't that amazing? What did Jesus say in John? He said, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Okay. So I get that. Like People say, well, he signified the death in which he died. Your Bible notes probably say he signified the death in which he died. But he said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up in the wilderness. And you get thinking about that, and you look it up, and you look up the story, and these guys were messing up bad. They, they, they loathed the worthless bread. They called the manna worthless. They got tired of God's provision. Type and shadow of Christ. Type and shadow of the gospel, of God's plan for sustenance. They're in the middle of nowhere, but they're somewhere because he's there. But all they saw was nowhere. And it's like coming out of your tent in the morning and the ground's just covered with manna. They didn't know what it was. That's what manna, what is it? But it was bread and it kept them alive and God wanted them to keep their eyes on his provision so he only let them get enough for the day. He didn't let them stockpile. 
If they took more than an omer, it filled with worms. Just to keep them trusting and believing. So they come out of their tent, and what did they start doing? I'm so sick of this place. I don't even know where we're at. This ugly view and all these rocks. They're forgetting about the cloud by day and the fire by night. They're forgetting about the manna every day all over the ground. So they come out and say, oh, same old stuff. Here we go again. Same old stuff. What is it anyway? And they loathe the worthless bread. The Bible says that they loathe. Paul in Corinthians 10 described this way. They tempted Christ. In other words, they're saying your plan for our lives isn't working. It's not good enough. And immediately these serpents just popped up out of everywhere. It sounds like a freaky sci-fi movie. They're popping up everywhere and they're coming and they're biting them. And they're dying by the thousands. And they're going, oh, we've sinned. And they run to Moses. Moses, you got to go to God. Tell him we're sorry we sinned. Freaking out, man. We're in the middle of this sci-fi movie. So he goes to God. He tells the Lord. People are sorry. They sinned. They realize what's happening now. You know, they're unthankful. Blah, blah, blah. And he's, he's tearing another piece of garment and throwing dirt in his head. He went through some clothes, man. He had to have some dirty hair, too. <laughs> Poor Moses. <laughs> Just nonstop, man. Living with them children in Israel. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> it's not a... Hey. He said, okay, Moses, here, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to do. I need you... Melt down a whole bunch of bronze and make a serpent, make a replica, make it look just like the thing that's biting them. I want you to lift that thing up on a pole. It's the medical symbol to this day. The snake on the pole. Yeah. Lift it on the pole. I'm reading that. I'm saved a month or two or three. I'm just saved a little bit and I'm, I'm reading that. It caught my attention. Just as so shall the Son of Man. So I go to, I reference the story and I read the story and I go, I'm sitting on my bed and I go, that seems so weird, though. Like, why would you tell Moses to make a replica of the thing that's killing him and hanging on a pole? Why wouldn't you lift up a flag that said, yeah? Like, why wouldn't you hold up Aaron's rod that budded and just represent life? Why wouldn't you? And the Lord spoke to me and he said, they're my Hebrew people. They know my law. They know that anything hanging on a pole has been cursed by God. So I made what was killing them and put it on the pole so they knew I heard Moses' prayer. And when they saw what was hanging on the pole was cursed by me, faith rose in their heart and anyone that was bitten was instantly healed. Why? Because they were forgiven. They lay a paralytic down. Jesus is such a teacher. They did not tear the roof off for Jesus to say your sins are forgiven. They tore the roof off so their buddy get up and walk. And Jesus said, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. I'm sure they're like, okay, great, pal. Do your thing, man. They don't understand. Pharisees are, who's this man think he is? Forgive him. And Jesus says, what is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise and walk. But to show you. The Son of Man has the power to forgive sins. Get up and walk. What's he saying? To be forgiven is to be healed. And then he says this in James. Confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you might be healed. And if they've committed any sins, that'll be forgiven too. James 5. What's he saying? If you're healed, you're forgiven. If you're forgiven, you're healed. Woo! Just as so shall the Son of Man. So what are we supposed to see? Are we supposed to see a suffering Savior? Are we supposed to cry and say God cried on that day? God didn't cry. He rejoiced. He sang. When, when, like, like, well, he didn't, he didn't sing there, but he rejoiced. He's he, in in, in uh, uh, Isaiah 53, it says, it pleased the Lord to bruise him and cause his soul to grieve and make him an offering for sin. It pleased the Lord. 
We think he cried. His plan of salvation is unfolding. He's, the devil's playing right into his hand like a pawn. And he's about to raise Jesus from the dead in a minute. It's like he's inspiring. He, Jesus says, do what you came for. It's your hour. For the hour of darkness is here. What did God do? He just pulls back, takes light away, and lets darkness act out. Because all it does is steal, kill, destroy, steal, kill, destroy. And he says, backs out, have your way. It's your hour for right now. Just do your thing. Phew! And they killed innocent blood. And they put him on a cross. But God didn't curse his son. God cursed sin in the flesh. And sin shall have no dominion over you. For the law of the spirit of life through Christ has made you free from the law of sin and death. You've got to see this stuff. It's so legal. It's so binding. It's so powerful. Jesus so knows what's happening. He ain't loving his own life. He says, do what you came for. It's the hour of darkness. They beat him, guys. And they didn't just punch him a few times. They beat him beyond recognition. The Bible says he was marred more than anyone was ever marred. He's still quoting scripture. He's saying, John, behold your mother, mother, behold your son, and you can't even recognize him. He's amazing. I got a nurse. You beat somebody beyond recognition and you can't even identify him by looks. They're probably already dead, shocked, coma. They ain't talking. How's Jesus talking? How isn't Jesus dead? If they beat him beyond recognition, and he's marred more than any of the sons of men. Come on, in that day they were pouring oil over Christians, soaking them in oil, and lighting them like candles. And they're screaming and burning. When the flame goes out, do you think they could tell if they were male or female? Do you think they could, you could tell if it was James, Jesse, Barney, or Fred? Jesus was marred more than anyone. And he's talking, and he's quoting scripture. Why? Adam sinned, and death entered the earth. And because all men sinned, all men died. Guess who never sinned? Guess who couldn't die? It's legal. It's the law of righteousness. He said, nobody takes my life. They couldn't. He can't die. So it's not until they tack him onto a tree and he was made to be sin that he gave his spirit. Nobody killed him, Oh, They couldn't. He's quoting scripture and you can't tell it's him. He's saying, mother, your son, son, your mother. He doesn't want you to see a suffering Savior. As Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. He doesn't want you to see a cursed son. He wants you to see sin cursed in the flesh. And sin has no dominion over you. That's why it's tragic for a Christian to believe condemnation for 30 seconds. It's condemnation is a lie. It's tragic for a Christian to buy into guilt for one minute. It's tragic for a Christian to believe shame for a second. Guilt says you're not forgiven. Condemnation says you're worthy to be judged. Shame says it's still who I am. They're all three anti-finished works of the cross. And they're all lies from hell. Tonight we're going to pray for the sick. Why? Because he loves us. 
because he took sin away. And we're not going to be healed because of works. We're not going to be healed because we prayed right. We're not going to be healed because we worshiped long enough and set up an atmosphere. We're going to be healed because we believe he loves us and the finished work is enough. Yeah. Whoever prayed for the sick, whoever noticed this, that sometimes you get tricked when you go to pray for the sick, you get caught up in what you're going to say, how you're going to pray, you try to pray right, pray powerful, and pray anointed. Who's ever put a lot of thought in their prayer when they prayed for the sick? Who shifted into self-consciousness without even realizing that now that I'm saying it, and it was more about your prayer than your faith for God to heal them. That's why we see so many things not happen. Because somehow we think it's our prayer. I have good, release-freeing news for you. Your prayer never will, never has, and never will heal the sick. You can't pray good enough, right enough, loud enough, proud enough. You believe Him. Watch. Be healed in Jesus' name is probably plenty when it's backed by a revelation of what He's done. Be made whole is probably enough. It's not, Father, I thank you, and right now, in the authority of Jesus, I've just be a little silly, but a little serious. <laughs> We're going to pray for this tonight. We're not going to pray long. We're just going to believe. God's going to do a lot of sweet things in the room. Nobody can change that or stop that. It's not my fault or yours. It's his fault. Because he loves people. Yeah. Who here has a sickness or an ailment in their body that if you were healed, there'd be no way to really tell right now because it's not symptomatic. It doesn't limit you. It doesn't hurt. It's internal. You'd need a test. Time would have to tell that you were healed. If you can, stand to your feet, those people that I, only in that category, you wouldn't really know, except for faith in your heart, you have a condition that right now you really wouldn't know if you were healed because there's no way to really check that in this moment. Don't stay sitting in your chair if that's you. Please stand up. Don't make me go fishing either. I'm a very good fisherman. Just stand up, please. Don't make me have to go fishing. Don't say, well, if God calls me out, I'll stand up. What are you talking about? Just stand up. <laughs> thank you for standing up. Yeah, thank you. I felt like I was waiting for about three more, and I got one. I might need two. Just stand up real quick if that's you. Thank you very much. Anybody else waiting? We're going to pray. Thank you. I got them. Good. I got a bonus. Did we have enough people to already pray for? We already had a bunch of people standing. Why was I waiting? Why did I ask for three more? Because this is real. And I want you involved. Yeah. I don't want you standing in your chair for some wrong reason of thinking. It's just humility to stand up. I don't want you saying, well, I've done this before and I'm never healed. Then I always feel bad because I don't get healed. And I don't know what's wrong with me. And something's got to be blocking my healing. Stop. That's not permissible tonight. You just stand up. I'm preaching the gospel tonight. <laughs> So you got to step in to faith. This is not yesterday. This isn't last month when you didn't get here. This is tonight. Right? So here's what we're going to do. If you're real close to one of those people that's standing, these are people that won't know if they're healed necessarily, but time will tell. The people standing, I'm just going to, it's not controlling. Listen, the only thing I want you to do, let me sound controlling. It just sounds funny. The only thing you have permission to do is believe God loves you right now. I don't want you praying. I don't want you praying in tongues. I don't want you going and say you're receiving. I just want you to relax. Just chill. See, I've been around us, but I just want you to relax and believe. Watch. Watch. Believe he loves you or he'd have never sent his son. Because when you're going through things that you stood for, it tries to question his love all the time. Rationale tries to question his love. And then you put a crisis on top of the uh, physical impairment. And then you put a car wreck or a layoff. Or a, and all of a sudden, three things. And now it's like, God, I thought you loved me. 
His love is never challenged by your circumstances. His love is established by the cross. You're rooted and grounded in love and faith works through love. So if Satan can keep love in question, he keeps faith at bay and you're a desperate prayer person at best instead of a covenant person. So the only permission you have if you stood up, I know I tricked you and got you up before I told you this. The only thing I want you doing is believe he loves you or he'd have never sent his son. I want just a couple people to jump up near somebody that's real near somebody that's standing. You just get your hand on them, on a shoulder, on a, just touch them somewhere discreetly. Don't smother them. It doesn't have to be everybody. Just somebody grab somebody. And all I want you to do is do this. I'm telling you, the fruit and the things God's doing in these little sessions is so phenomenal to me. I'm so excited about it. All I want you to do right now is say, be made whole. Don't even ask them what's wrong. It's not necessary. Just say, be made whole in Jesus' name. If you're being prayed for, just believe he loves you or he'd have never said it done. Be made whole in Jesus' name. No more sickness, no more weakness, no more symptoms. In the authority of Jesus, and be whole. Father, we thank you for change. We thank you for healing your children. We thank you, thank you, thank you in Jesus' name. If you were being prayed for, I want you to just thank God for loving you right now in your heart. Thank God for changing that situation. And just thank God. But the manifestation and the realization of healing is right around the corner as time reveals, a test reveals, or whatever it needs to reveal that this thing is gone. Amen? Father, thank you. Amen. That's how simple we need to believe and keep our lives. So if you leave here and you're in a grocery line and you hear somebody talking about, I'm so glad I don't have a migraine. I usually have migraines and I can't believe I didn't have a migraine today. And da da da. Man, just tap and say, hey, I couldn't help but you. I heard you tell that gentleman up there, listen. Man, you got nothing to lose. Please don't say, I say this. I say, please don't say no. I say that before I ask. I say, please don't say no. Let me just pray for you. I won't make a scene. Nobody will know what we're doing. Let me just pray for you and believe that thing will never come. You got nothing to lose. Because if it never comes, that's going to get your attention. Because I heard it's been coming regular. I'm telling you, he loves you and he can take it away. Yeah? I do this stuff a lot. I'm in an airport. I hear people talking. I'm sitting waiting for a flight and they're talking. They're behind me talking. They say, man, I can't even my back, this and that. And I spin right around. Hey, man, I couldn't help but what you heard. Listen, let's just pray right now. Don't even hesitate. And please don't say no. Jesus is a big deal. And if I knew nothing would happen, I'd never turn around and ask. But because I've seen this again and again, I can't not ask. Please let me pray for you. That's what I do. And people go, okay. Yay. <laughs> you could be paying for your sandwich at the... And you see, realize they're on their feet. They're subway. They're up on their feet all the time. Hey, you've been on your feet all the time. It's not busy right now. I'm just wondering, how's your hips? How's your feet? What's going on? It's amazing you asked me. That. True stories. It's amazing you asked me that. I got special shoes on order right now because it's so hard to stand. And by the end of the day, I'm so jacked up in my hips, blah, blah, blah. I said, no way. Are you in pain right now? Oh, right now. It's shoot up to me. You're going to love this. <laughs> Give me your hand real quick. What? They think you're reading their palm. <laughs> Give me your hand. They go like this. <laughs> like they're going to read your lines or something. <laughs> Just let me see your hand. It's not a trick. It's not a joke. I need to see your hand. They'll go like this. You just take the fingers like this. Six seconds. So you're, not, you're not putting them under pressure. You're not praying over their four generations. You're not quoting ten Old Testament scriptures. <laughs> Father, I just thank you for your amazing, unstoppable love for them. Pain you get out of them now. In the authority of Jesus' name, you leave their body. You leave their feet. Thank you. In Jesus' name. And they're going... What? What? Some people go, what the blank? <laughs> and when they say that word, the pain doesn't shoot back into their legs. Isn't that amazing? That they never catch God off guard. Had a military guy with a torn ACL walking down the sidewalk. We parked the car. What's happened, man? What's going on with you? This is a buff dude, man. Combat trained. He'll take you out, right? What? He said... I tore my ACL, man. They want to replace my tendon, do a surgery. I'm just trying to tough it out, man. I told them I'll be okay. They said I'll never heal. Oh, man, you can heal. Listen, boom, your knees hit the cement. He's already freaked out. I'm going to pray for you. You parked to pray for me? Yeah, that's not radical. Let me tell you radical. Years and years and years ago, like a couple thousand, this innocent man who was really God that became a man, that's radical, he died on the cross for this day. So I could pray for your knee and you could be restored and you could see his great love for you. And you just pray for his knee. So now he goes, what the blank? Because that's all he knows. 
And he ain't like an offense to Holy Spirit. In a minute, he can learn that ain't necessary. But here's what didn't happen. He's like, what the black? Whoa. <laughs> it did come flying back. Man, we prayed for like a 75, 6, 8-year-old lady one time. And her neighbor was with her in the mall. And she was crippled up from an accident for a long, long time. Like, long time. Late 60s, 70s. We pray. She's got a cigarette. We're outside at the corridor of the mall, ready to go in. She's got the cigarette. She's standing at this little smoke station. She's so funny. She said, I'm Catholic. So we said, okay. We just want to pray for you. Okay. She said, just a minute. She put her cigarette down. As soon as we stop praying. So we said, we're going to pray for you again. Wait a minute. She said it down. We prayed for her. We said, listen, we're just going to pray one more time. We weren't like, God, please. We were like, you come out of her pain. You leave body. You respond. We were aggressive. She liked us. She's like, you guys. And uh, her body changed. She did things that made her neighbor cry. Because her neighbor knew there's no way. This girl smoking her cigarette, she starts swearing and cursing. You ain't never heard nothing. It's like, what is she doing? She's somebody's grandmother. And she's like ripping and tearing with work. And she's like, what the blankety blank? I can't blankety believe. You mean a blankety blank? And I'm like, honey, whoa, easy, easy. <laughs> Ain't it something, the mercy of God, that he comes and does that knowing she's about to rant in the only thing she knows. Gee. He's so good. So watch this. The number one reason Christians don't pray for the sick, I've found, is because they're afraid nothing will happen. They don't want to be into that, in that middle of that situation. So because they're afraid nothing will happen, they don't pray for the sick, so they always have what they're afraid of. They're just not in that position. It's a self-serving lie. The signs follow a believer. If I said, who's a believer? You all raise your hands because you're saying I'm saved. But the signs that follow a believer, you will lay your hands on the sick and the sick will recover. <laughs> so if you're going to tell me you're a believer, you best get your hands on somebody. <laughs> Are you all okay? Okay, I'll move along. It's 941. Help us, Jesus. We started early, gave me extra time. Oh, it's 108 now. <laughs> they fixed that thing. It's going to be 109 soon. <laughs> if you're sick in your body and you would know if you're healed, and you could check it without exaggeration, without emotion, as great as this worship team is, did you notice I didn't call no music up here? We're not setting atmosphere. The atmosphere is the kingdom and it's here. You can't, you can't put these people in a little fold up to miniature box and shrink them down and fold it up and get out in Walmart parking lot. And now you approach a car and you're talking to somebody and you're like, oh, I need it. You just pull it out. Just open it up and they all pop up. Shabba. It just ain't like that. It's usually you and them and your nerves and them looking at you like you're half crazy and you're wondering if... That's usually like that. So have fun with it. Just be free. Tell them, look, the worst that can happen is nothing and that ain't why I stopped you. Here's what I say to a lot of people. Do you think I ran across the street and offered what I'm offering if I knew nothing would happen? The reason I ran across this street, because I've been in this thing, doing this thing, loving on people, praying and believing, and I've seen it happen. And I don't want to walk by you. It's hard to walk by you. Just wonder if. And I know that ain't how I believe the wonder if. I'm believing he's coming, but it helps them. And I'll do it. I say, you got nothing to lose. If I didn't run across the street, you're limping the rest of the way. You got nothing to lose. If nothing happens, you got what you had before I crossed the street. So you ain't even disappointed because you ain't even expecting nothing. But I came across the street and I'm serious. Now let me pray for you. You got nothing to lose. Okay. 
I could stand here for hours and tell you stories and not try to remember. They just come because it's how we live. It's how we live. It's not because I'm Pastor Dan. I'm a believer. And if heaven remembers me for one thing, a believer, everything else is in place. Every promise is to the believer. Not an office, not a badge, not a title. Believer. Yeah? Is there anybody, before any, everybody responds, is there anybody here you want prayer? It's just hard to stand up or you can't stand up, but you do want prayer and you'd like to stay sitting. I want to see who you are first so we don't lose you in the crowd. Anybody? Just make sure I see you if you're here. You all good? Okay. Now, I need you to participate. Don't stay in your chairs. If you're sick in this room in any way and you're not confessing sickness, you're not claiming sickness. James says, is any among you sick? Let them ask for prayer. What you're saying is there's something in my life that I know I wasn't created for that's outside. And if you'll pray, God will heal because he's good. This ain't what I'm here created for. You're not claiming sickness when you stand up for prayer. You're saying there's something in my life that's not right. And I want God to move that thing out because of what he paid for because I believe he loves me. Are you with me? You got sickness in your body. If you were healed tonight, without exaggeration, without music jamming, without you trying to make the person that prayed for you not feel bad, that would be called lying. You would know it if you're healed. I need you to stand up. If you have something going on in your body, that your body's less than whole, and if you were healed, you'd be able to take your time without exaggeration, and wow, I'm changed. There was a guy... Oh my goodness, it would make us all cry. We just cried. He was crying and he said, I, I'm pretty sure God just healed me. And I'm like, you're like pretty sure? So we're all laughing and we're talking to him. He's been hurt so bad. His back's been so bad. He's been so, he's almost like, he's afraid to move. He's afraid to do anything. He's lived protected and he has excruciating pain nonstop. So he's trying to live protected so it doesn't get worse. And now he's standing there and he, can't, he don't feel no pain. And he felt like touched. But he's afraid to move. And I said, was it hard for you to walk? He said, oh my gosh. I had to walk gingerly. It was real hard to walk. I said, could you step up on things? Well, I could, but it would hurt so bad. I said, listen, I feel like you've been protecting yourself, right? You've been living very protected. He said, oh my gosh, yeah. I said, listen, I'm totally... Like, I'm seeing this. I'm in tune with this. You don't have to be afraid. He said, see, but unbelief. I said, stop. I need you to come out. I want you to walk with me briskly and step up onto that platform. You're going to be fine. You just need to reveal to yourself because you live protected for so long. He comes out and he starts bawling and he goes, chuk, 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 boom, boom. He can't find any pain. He starts jumping and doing stuff. Zero pain. <laughs> Wasn't emotional, music wasn't jamming. He's just touched in six seconds. Anybody else need to stand? You got pain in your body, you got something in your body that's less than wholeness. Less than wholeness. I feel like there's somebody, you got a condition in your eyes. You're even concerned about it and it's showing up and it could get worse and you didn't stand up. I need somebody to stand up that has something going on in their eyes but you didn't stand up. Did I get you? Is that you? Good. Don't make me go fishing. I'm a real good fisherman. There's no need for me to have to cast my line tonight. Just stand up. If you have arthritis and stuff, this isn't a word of knowledge. It's just giving examples. If you have arthritis that you know you have arthritis, if your knees aren't what they used to be and you have trouble working steps and getting up and down and you feel it and you're just, don't just say, well, I'm not getting any younger. Stop. Arthritis can leave your body. I've seen a lady, 82 years old, that couldn't even pick up a fork and all her fingers were going in the same direction and watched her fingers crack and pop and go straight. You say, well, I don't believe that. I understand there's a lot of unbelief in the body of Christ, but it doesn't mean it didn't happen. What, am I telling you that because I'm a sicko? I'm twisted? I need your temporal? Whoa. I need you to stand up. I feel like we just need a couple more people to, that need to stand up and don't miss their moment. That if you're healed, you'll know it. There's something going on in your body and you'll know it. You good? We good? Okay. 
okay, I'm just going to obey this. I just hear this, and I don't think it's, just think it's one person. It's your hips. It's your hips. They hurt. They ache. You're still sitting in your chair. But it wouldn't take you long to make it grind or hurt and grab you like, ow, it's your hips. For some reason, you didn't stand yet. I need you to stand. Your hips. Did you stand? Did I get you? Okay, good. All right, here's what we're going to do. The people sitting, I set you all up again. You're going to be my prayer team. If you're nervous, that's great. If you're nervous, I am pumped. Because you won't be overconfident or self-confident. If you're nervous, I really want you on my roster. If you said, I've never done this, tell your person, I've never done this. <laughs> but the people sitting are going to be my prayer team. And here's what I need you to do. The people standing, don't pray for anybody yet. Just claim a person. Just have fun with it. Break the ice and say, hey, you're mine. And I ain't never done this before. Raise your hand if you're standing just for identification, location, so we don't lose you in the crowd. Raise one hand high if you're standing for prayer. Do not put it down until somebody claims you. When they come and say, hey, I'll pray with you, you put it down. That way everybody can run to hands that are still up and we'll get the room covered quickly. We got plenty of people in this room to cover the people standing. I, I can see the math. Okay? Don't pray yet. Just go claim a person. If you're sitting, if you're uncomfortable and you're sitting, I would encourage you to please get up and make a move forward. We're not going to keep record of that. You're not going to get in trouble. We, you don't owe us anything. I'm just trying to get you involved and inspired. You can't go wrong. I'm going to teach you something tonight. You can't make a mistake. You're not under pressure. You ain't going to pray wrong. You can't go wrong tonight. The only way you can go wrong is if you don't get involved and you could get involved. Okay, I still got a couple hands up. I got a hand up. I got a hand up right there. I got a lady in the back. Can I have, a, can I have somebody go and stand with the lady in the back? Got her? Good. Got her? I got one more lady right here, and oh, he's claimed. You can put your hand down. I got a lady right here, though. She's like, anybody going to stand with me? Come on, I need somebody. Will somebody come and pray for her? a girl, thank you. Yay. And the Jesus in you is plenty. It's going to be good. Yeah, I felt like I was supposed to tell you that. You be encouraged and start being really confident in your life about the Jesus that's in you. Okay. Yeah, that's not a correction. That's a cheer on. Yeah. Okay, everybody got their person? Okay. I need you to take like three seconds, give them the three-second version, and tell your person that's going to pray for you why you stood up. The three-second version. Just arthritis pain, herniated disc, tore labrum in my, in my shoulder. Just give them a three-second version. Tell them why you stood up. And then come, give me your attention again. As soon as you know, come right back. Don't pray yet. Just come right back to me. Y'all ready? You guys are good. You did that quick. See, I want to do this together. Now watch this. Nobody can mess up tonight because watch. The reason I ask you to ask them is because Matthew 17 says, if you have faith, you'll say to the mountain, what? And the mountain will what? And nothing shall be impossible for God. And nothing shall be impossible for you. That's amazing. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to speak to that thing. And if they told you I have arthritis pains in my joints, arthritis, you leave them now in the authority of Jesus' name. Be completely pain, pain free and total mobility in Jesus' name. Who knows you can do that in a short time? Tonight, watch this. I'm only giving you, I was going to give you six, but I changed it to five. I'm going to give you five seconds to pray. Watch, it's because I love you. Watch, nobody can get in trouble in five seconds. You don't even have time to get self-conscious. You, you, you watch, watch. Knees be restored, herniated disc. You disc, you be healed. No more pain. Jesus' name. Who knows we can do this? Watch, be whole in Jesus' name. That's two seconds of sincerity and faith, believing God loves the person. It's not your prayer. It's His finished work. See, that's the difference. It's not your prayer. It's your faith. You get it? So tonight, you got five seconds. It's so fun. You watch and see what God does in the room. It's fun. So watch this. When they pray, five seconds, I'm going to say, okay, guys, wrap it up. 
So I'll no sooner say, go ahead, I'll be like, okay, wrap it up pretty quick, right? When I say wrap it up, all I want you to do is in the name of Jesus, because that's very important. In the name of Jesus. You, it be whole, okay, guys, wrap it up. In the name of Jesus. I say to people, you don't have to say this, but I feel like it's lacking in people's lives, so I just say it. I say, Father, thank you for your love. I just acknowledge his love. I just do that personally. You don't have to, but I like to. The people that stood up for prayer tonight, remember the only thing you have permission to do? Just like the first group, what? Please tonight just believe God loves you. And if he didn't love you, he'd have never sent his son. So he has to love you because he came. Wow. As they're praying for you tonight, wow, you really do love me or you'd have never sent your son. I believe you love me. The people that are praying, you got five seconds, whatever they told you, eyes be restored, hearing be, be made whole, knees you be strong, pain you come out of their feet in the name of Jesus. Who knows we can do this in five seconds, be sincere and believe God. Be under zero pressure. So as soon as I say wrap it up, we're going to wrap it up when, when, when they're finished praying and they wrap it up and I want you to acknowledge God's love in your heart and thank him that he loves you and then I want you to do this. Take some time. And legitimately, seriously, without exaggeration, start checking your body. Some people just know instantly when they're healed and they're like, whoa. They just know because it's their body. Sometimes you need to just really check that thing. Do something that would have been very difficult. Something you couldn't have done. I was in a service a little while back. It happens a lot. But this service, it was two people. Their shoulders were so messed up. Their wives had to put their shirts on. So the wife's over praying and the husband's testifying, freaking out. And he's taking his shirt. He had a jacket on. He was taking it off, putting it on, taking it off, putting it on. And she gets over and she gets up on a chair. Somebody said, that's your husband. She's, <laughs> Why? Because she has to put everything on. So she knows God touched her husband because he can't do that. But he can do that. And it hit her. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to check our bodies. When you know you're healed. I just need you to go like this and let me know when you know you're healed. Now, listen, this is very important. See, I wanted to teach this out. This is why we didn't do it last night. So tonight we're just getting late and doing it tonight. We just really good to do it. If your body changes somewhat, but not all the way, just tell your person, say, hey, I'm like 40% better. Hey, I'm 60%. I'm like 80% better. Just tell them and say, would you just speak that over me one more time? I'm just believing God's going to make... Father, thank you for what you're doing in them. Knees, you be completely restored. Growth, you be removed. Whatever it is, boom, and just pray again. Thank God for what he's doing and thank him for that finished work. Bam, 100%, and then check it again, okay? When you know you're healed, I need to know. I might get you to share a little testimony, whatever. If you feel like nothing changed, I don't want you to sign off. Please don't walk out here. I knew I shouldn't have stood up. Every time I stand, nothing ever... Had no ever permission to do that. A Christian has one response in their life. God, thank you for what you're doing. I so appreciate the faith that surrounded me tonight and the love you have for me. God, I'm excited. So watch this. Here's what I want to happen tonight. I want you to do this because this is going to be fun. If nothing changes in your symptom and situation, I want you to just listen to a couple testimonies. And when you listen to the testimonies, thank God that he's a healer. Thank God he's good. Appreciate what he's doing. And then thank God. That he's doing it in you. And after you hear the testimony, check it again. You hear another test, check it again. I've watched it over and over again. If we won't let go, if we just keep believing. See, faith, faith isn't a hit, miss, win, or lose. Faith's not a point in time. It's not like, you get what I'm saying? Faith is the, it, faith is the position of your heart to believe that he'll do what he, he, he said he'd do and he accomplished. You get it? So tonight, like popcorn in a bag... People are going to be going, man it, still, man, it still has a glitch. Okay, well, listen to this testimony. Wow. I can see there. Wow, look at the emotion there. You could tell that happened. Whoa, God, you're doing something. Wow, I appreciate you doing it in me. And then your person, Father, thank you for what you're doing. Check in. Here another testimony. Like popcorn in a bag. Things just start changing, changing. Why? Because we're not turning faith into a point in time. We're turning faith into a position of our heart. If I would have looked at my wife sucking on that respirator after my 20-second prayer, I'm shaking in my shoes. But if I just leave the hospital believing what I prayed for 20 seconds is what he's doing, I'm in pretty good shape. You get what I'm saying here? You all ready? 
Now watch, I, I talk a long time, so you didn't forget what you're praying for, did you? You don't need to go back and get your three-second refresh, do you? You hit the, hit the refresh button? Okay, here's what I want you to do and have fun with this. Just look at your person with like warm eyes, like they're so worth this. Just look at them and make them feel so uncomfortable, like you are so worth this. <laughs> okay, you all ready? You all ready? I know you don't believe this, but I'm not going to talk for five seconds. <laughs> you guys, it's just you and Jesus and your person. You're going to pray. You're going to receive his love. They're going to pray for you. God's going to move. Five seconds. I'll stop you. We'll check our bodies. We'll testify. Are you ready? You ready? Give your people the kingdom. Five seconds. Go for it right now. Believe God. Oh, it's good. They're all involved. Yeah, wow, I gave you like seven seconds. <laughs> That's good. That's so good. Just begin to wrap it up. Wrap it up. Wrap it up in Jesus' name. It's because He loves us, people. Believe that right now. If you were prayed for, it's because He loves you. He did the work on the cross. It's His good pleasure. Thank Him for loving you. You can wrap it up. Everybody should be stopping praying now. Now, I want you guys to start checking your bodies. Start checking your bodies. If you knew right away you were healed, you can let me know. But if, if check your bodies, and as soon as you know you're healed, let me know. I need to know. I need you to go like this so I can see you. As soon as you know you're healed, let me know. Check your bodies. Make sure. Check your bodies. What are you all doing back there? Jumping jacks? Go like this if you know you're healed. Is there anybody you know for sure? Yeah? Can you shout it out? What happened? What, what are you healed from? Try to help us understand. What was it? Was it always there? Is it always pain? Is it, can you find it if you look for it? Help us understand. How, how do you know it's changed? How do you know to raise your hand that it's healed? What, what did you do? How do you know? It's just not there. Just gone. Beautiful. Beautiful. Would you guys, would you guys, so you would have been able to tell it was there if you had checked and moved a certain way. So you did all that. It's just not there. Stretch your hands to this young man. Would you guys do it as the body of Christ? Father, we thank you for what you did in him tonight. We just believe that it'll never come back and never show up again, God. We thank you tonight he'll sleep amazing. He won't wake up and have to shift, move, and readjust in the night. He won't wake up and have to try to get going in the morning. Father, we just thank you. He'll wake up fresh. He'll wake up so aware of you that this is even an hour of greater intimacy and greater awareness of the person of God in his life. Father, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen? Yeah. Check your bodies and let me know if you know you're healed. I just want you to let me know if you know you're healed. You know it for sure? Did it happen right away or did it just kind of happen as you were checking? Okay. Oh, you smell. You couldn't smell? Not since August. You haven't smelled? And you smell right now? What'd you check with? Something that you could definitely smell? Yeah? Does that have a smell? Yeah? Wow. So, uh... So, so is there something else? Anybody got something she can smell? Anybody have like a pack of breath mints? Stick of gum? Anybody have a little shot of perfume? You smell that easy? Wait a minute. You couldn't smell at all since August? Oh, that's not good. And now you just smell the, the mint smell, you smell the, you smell it. strong. Oh, I look how excited you look. So good. You know? You know you're healed? Did it just happen? Or? I had surgery on Tuesday. Surgery on Tuesday. What'd you have surgery for? What did they do? Whoa. So there was a lot of pain since the surgery? Down into your fingers and your forearm? Where was the pain? So the things you're doing right now with all this, you wouldn't have wanted to move it all around like that? Would that have irritated it? Would that have hurt more? My son pumped my arm and ankle. Wow. Doing this. I got a brace on. Uh-huh. I can see that. But, this, but you're able to check it. You're, you're checking it. You don't feel nothing pain-wise. 
I'm doing this, guys, not because I'm like, don't believe him. I want us to understand. It's his body. He knows. But sometimes we're like, okay, wow, he doesn't have pain in his arm. Sometimes we need to understand what they've been living with, what they've experienced, what it's been like, so we can appreciate what God's really doing. What's that? That's, that's your call. I never tell people to do that. I, I, I've, I've seen amazing things with people. We were in a service and a lady had a thing up the whole way up and she was supposed to wear it for 11 weeks. And the, the, she was taking it off. And I ran over. I said, whoa, 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 honey. I thought it was zealous people saying, well, you need to take it off. And I said, whoa, 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 honey. Whoa, what are you doing? She said, I'm taking it off. I said, are they telling you to take it off? She said, no, I'm taking it off. I said, you're taking it off. Are you sure? She said, I'm sure. She took it off and she's like totally healed. She was wearing the thing for 11 more weeks. Totally healed. It was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Anybody else that knows they were healed when we prayed? Anybody else? You know for sure? Yeah? Shout it out. What happened? For nine months. 24-7? Yeah. It's not there at all? So you've been checking and thinking like you're actually like... It's gone. Stretch your hands to this young lady. Father, we just thank you for what you've done in her. And we thank you that will never, ever come back again. We just speak spinal health over you. Yep. Disc health, vertebrae health, nerve health. Just, just, just total wholeness down through her skeletal, her back, her body. God, we just thank you. This will never, ever, ever show up again. In Jesus' name. Amen? Man, don't you love this stuff? Is there anybody else who knows you're healed yet? Anybody else? You do? There's some about. This is a hot section, man. This is anointed section right here. You guys should be putting. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you had the same thing going on. Go on. It's... And was it all the time? So it's years. Years. And it's gone. You gotta love that, guys. That's a five second prayer. Yeah? Anybody else? Somebody else raise your hand. Yeah. So you've got mobility, that the glitch is out of there, the pain's out, you can just move it, use it, it's gone. Dude, that's so good. Yeah! Okay, you gotta do something else to wrap up, but is there anybody else who knows you're totally healed? We just didn't get to you yet. You know you're healed. Let me see this. How many people you didn't raise your hand because it's not totally healed, but you know it changed, it got better, and it's it's a noticeable percentage change. Look at that, guys. This is God moving. This is God moving. Is your person still here? Your person still here and close to you? Because you ain't getting another person. <laughs> In a minute, I'm going to have you guys pray. I want to do this quick. I'm going to just try to save time. This is a big one. I always address it. A lot of people don't talk about this. Who's standing here and you say, I've been listening to testimonies, I've been checking my body, but every symptom's the same, nothing's changed. As far as I can tell, my body's exactly how it was when I first stood up for prayer. Nothing seems to have shifted or changed. Let me see your hands. Don't be embarrassed. That's not a hit on you. There's nothing. Don't take an identity from that. Just be bold and let me know that's you. Is your person still here? Find them. Make sure you get your person. You ain't switching people. You ain't saying, who brings my pain for that sign up? <laughs> Get your person. Is your person there? Is your person there? Is you want a voice? Get your, let me see where you are. Is your person, everybody, oh, you? You got her? Okay, here's what I want to do. This is only the people that nothing changed up until now. I want you right now, watch. That five second prayer, I'm not saying you have to directly quote it, but don't try to pray something different or fancy. If you remember what you prayed, basically just pray 
that five second prayer with sincerity back over them and thank God for what he's doing. And you thank God he loves you. Let's just pray one more time. Five seconds. Give it to him right now. Kingdom of God. In Jesus name. Wholeness. This is going to be fun. These are people that nothing changed. Father, thank you. Okay? Okay, wrap that up. Wrap that up. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Thank God he loves you. Thank God he loves you or he'd have never sent his son. This is only my group that people that said nothing changed. Start checking your bodies for me. Checking your bodies. Did anybody in my group completely change that time? You just changed. Let me see you if you changed. Like healed. I'm talking 100% healed. Anybody in that group, check it. Let me ask you this. I'll just ask you this. Did anybody somewhat change that time in that group? Did anything somewhat change in that group? Somewhat change? What percentage? 50%? About 50? Yeah. Good. And nothing up until then. Anybody else somewhat changing? Anybody else? Check your bodies for me. Stay with me. Somewhat? I feel like somebody's getting like healed in the group. Check your bodies, please, for me. Is there anybody completely healed in my last group? Who's feeling like somebody's just changing on me? You got somewhat changed, though, son? You, you, did you get somewhat better? Did you get somewhat better that time? Yeah. How much, what, what happened? How much percent are you changed? 70? Wow. The whole time up until then, it was the same. And that last five seconds, it just changed. Did you? You prayed? You telling me Jesus is in you? <laughs> yeah? I think so. Pray one more time for him. That's awesome. That's a 70% change right there. Now watch. Here's the thing that we're learning. If we jump to conclusions, if we just weigh our experience, our results, or lack of results, and we draw conclusions and change our theology every time, we'll never be in faith. He's checking his body this whole time. He's got people standing around him. He's listening to testimonies and nothing's changing. We said, you know what? Take that group. Let's pray five more seconds and just say the same thing and believe God. Boom. And he's 70% changed. Wonder if he'd have walked out of here and said, man, I should have never stood up. I never get healed. Are you guys with me? The Christian has one response. Thank you, God, for loving me and what you're doing in my life. Is there anybody else in my last group that feels changed, somewhat changed? Anybody that feels somewhat changed? Somewhat? A little bit, like 30% or something or what? About 50? Okay, good. What, what's, what are we believing for? Eyes. Okay, is it just vision clarity stuff? Okay. How, so what that do symptomatically? Okay. So when you say about 50, is it just feel like it's focusing a little better? You're seeing a little more clear. You're locking in on things. Let's pray for him right now and believe God's going to give this other 50. Come on, guys. Let's believe right now in front of us because he loves this young man. He's going to fix his eyes. Pray that, son. That's right. The young man there with your hand on him, just pray. Eyes be completely made whole. Focus be restored. Just say that over him. In the authority of Jesus' name. God, thank you. Okay, son, don't make anything up. There's no wrong answer. Just tell me what's going on when you're looking around. A little better than it was? Like better than 50%? What's going on? Because I don't know what you were really experiencing. I have a general idea from what you told me. But yeah, look around. Just really look around. Test it. Who are you? Your mama. You would know from looking at his eyes? Why? Because they were moving? or So he's 75% better. You're saying that as a mom. Guys, we're going to pray again. Are you guys fired up or are you guys like tired of this? Or you're not tired of this, right? I'm going to pray for you, son. Jesus loves you, dude, like so much, like loves you. Yeah, young man, that's great. You're doing great. Believe. Pray, church. We're thankful for 75, right? But he is a finished work, right? Did he pay for the restoration of this young man? 
eyes be whole in Jesus name. Right. Come on, church. Let's believe it. Son, just believe God loves you. That's why he's doing it. Right. It's not because we're praying right. It's not because we're all praying together. It's because we believe he loves you. He forgives your sin and he heals all your diseases in Jesus name. Check them out for me one more time. Yeah, let mom help me. Is it about still the 75% or does it? It feels even better. Okay. Will we see you guys tomorrow? Will you be at church? Are you playing hooky or don't you come here? (laughs) Are you sleeping in? (laughs) You are so precious. We're going to check in. You guys let me know. Will you, if you come here tomorrow? Will one of you track me down? Just let me know what's going on. And when you go to bed tonight, will you do this? This is, this is sweet. I want you to all learn to do this, everybody. When you go to bed tonight and ain't nobody around, you finally tuck in, turn off whatever, and you, you're ready to go to sleep, talk to the Lord. Say, Father, I appreciate you. And I thank you. You love me. And I do believe you're doing the work in my eyes. And I thank you for it. Man, I'm just thanking you for loving me. Just receive his love, acknowledge what he's doing, and go to sleep in him. And then when you wake up in the morning, you'll be like, all right? And you guys just tell me what you're experiencing. As mama, you know, because you've known. Because you were sharp. You were like, look his way, look his way. He's 75%. I'm like, what? Mama's on it. Is there anybody else, as we're doing all this, you feel like your body's changing? Is anybody healing? Is there anybody else you feel like your body's changing? Yeah? What happened? Is it? What's that from? Okay. You heard what I told him about when he goes home tonight. I'm telling this to everybody that was prayed for. Commune with the Lord. Get real used to, not familiar with, just in the practice of communing with the Lord. Receiving his love, thanking him for his grace in your life and what he's doing in your body and your heart. And just talk to him before you go to bed. Like if you crawl in your bed and your hip grabs you, oh, don't be like, oh, man, I was hoping tonight was the night I was healed. I don't know why I'm not ever healed. No. Oh, Father, I thank you for your love for me. And God, I so appreciate what you're doing in my life and my body. I thank you for a great night's sleep tonight just because your hand's upon me because you love me. And I appreciate what you're doing in my life. That's how your hip changes. I promise you. So let's just do this thing, man, in God. Are you all good? This Wasn't this fun, though? Like, people being healed changed. There was a lot of people that were somewhat changed. I'm closing. It's 1016. Let's do one more thing, because you know you won't be bashful to do this. Will you all lift your hands to the king? Would you yield to him and thank him and just begin to honor him? Would you personally right now just tell him he's amazing and you love him? You put all your trust in him, that you believe he's the Lord of your life, that his hand and grace is sufficient and it's on you. Would you just thank him if you were prayed for tonight that he's healing you, he's restoring you. Just love on him. Just appreciate him in your heart right now. You can mutter it out, you can think it, you can speak it, but just take time before we leave to thank him for who he is in your life. Father, we thank you, we worship you, and we honor you. And God, Father God, we just thank you. We thank you for who you are among us, what you're doing in us, that you're you're causing us to raise up in a place of one heart, one faith, one mind, that there's a unity being formed on the earth of the body of Christ, that there's a people that know who they are and why they are, that understand their whole mission and call in life to shine, to walk in love, to manifest Christ. I just believe it, Lord, and I believe you're working that right here in this room. An unshakable, unmovable people that are finding grace, according to the end of Hebrews. Because everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Let us have grace, therefore, that we might stand. And Lord God, I thank you that this is a house that stands and manifests the heart, love, and nature of Almighty God. Father, I thank you that this place where sickness is stayed, God, and pushed away, where God, if something does try to creep in, we see it literally blasted and overcome by the love and power of the Lord Jesus Christ. I just pray for this amazing release of healing 
through the people here into their spheres of influence and into this community. I pray that it's actually said that there is like a healing outbreak. And what they don't understand is it's just people seeing the truth, knowing who they are, and walking in it. And Lord, people will try to label it and tag it. And you, these guys will just say, no, it's just simple faith. It's just simple faith. We're just walking in what we believe. And we're living this thing. Now, I declare it. I actually see this like a healing outbreak is what people will try to call it. It's just people living their life in Christ Jesus. I see it touching this area. I see unbelievers affected by it. I see bodies being changed. I declare it in the authority of Jesus' name excitedly and boldly. I see this outpouring of healing in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm finished. I'm finished. Whatever you want to do, my friend, in your house. <laughs> I have nothing to add or take away from anything that just happened. That's Ecclesiastics 3.13. That's it. That's it. And for me, it was the book of Opinions, chapter 2, verse 3. I, tomorrow morning, uh, service starts at 10 o'clock. We're going to jump right back in. If you can be with us, please come. But I am not asking, hey, can we stop? Can we stop? Thank you. I'm not asking anybody to take away from their house. I'm not asking anybody to come here to join us on Sunday. If, you, if you're in a house, if you're part of a house, be there, do that. That's what I'm saying. We will be back here tomorrow at 10 again, doing the same thing yet again. So if you can join us, we want you to be here. You're welcome. The door is open, okay? But I, I want to honor the other pastors in the region. I want to honor the other houses in the region. And you're needed there, okay? But if you've, if you've already done it to be here, be here with us. We love you. See you tomorrow.